hello. Wow. Look at how many people we got today. It's all right. Just the cool kids are here this time. Somebody's got some purple hair, I think, going on. Is that per Heck yeah, girl. Love it. And that watermelon looks delicious. Stop it. Mmm. I'm going to sprinkle some of that chili salt on it. Mm. Oh, girl. You know what's up. You know what's up. It's the only way to eat watermelon, in my opinion. It's almost spring break. Everyone excited? I'm all types of excited. I just took my exam. Went well. I'm done. None of my teachers are giving me homework. I actually get to have fun. First spring break in a hot minute that that happens. Last spring break, I was busy arranging all these lights and green screen, figuring out how to teach online. Crazy that that was a year ago. Whew. I don't know if you all have been hearing things, but it seems like we're going back next semester. They're asking at least the instructors if we want to teach live, so maybe we'll be going back. Okay get a move on shall we first off <laughs> yeah that's what it felt like little did we know somebody said we all thought we were getting a second spring break um, it's like yeah yeah another week oh another week oh this is indefinite <laughs> all right so first and foremost we have a winner for the skittles <laughs> this person guessed two away from what I counted, and also mind you what I counted like I was counting them and the first couple times I did it I was really like crazy about it but now it's like the fourth time I do this in a class and I'm like no oh, was that two or three I don't know so it's like it also has like a confidence interval around it the true number is in there somewhere but somebody guessed two Skittles away from the number I counted, and the number I counted was 365. I don't know if that person even remembers their guess. Oh no, excuse me, six away from what I counted, I think. But it was actually somebody in the, in the studio audience right now. It was you, Mr. Jason. <laughs> He's all types of thrilled. I'm thrilled because I don't have to mail it since you live down the street. I'm just gonna leave it like at your mailbox. <laughs> Because it costs like $15 to mail those stupid things, if you can believe it. Shipping and cartridge ink never goes down in price. I just made his day, apparently. <laughs> all right. So thank you all for participating. Next up, back to work. Okay, so what do we have do? What do you have do? Uh, you have your quiz on Sunday and your R assignment. They're both due by 11.59. P PM. Um, if you need help doing the R assignment, go into the modules. There is a video there that uh, it's from Tuesday. It I think it's labeled just 5.2-3 or whatever, but it has the R stuff at the beginning. Also have a link to it in the announcements if you can't find it. And might as well get your tell somebody about confidence intervals out of the way. Just get her done. So. Because I'm sure some of your teachers are going to bombard you with assignments when you get back. So get all of my assignments out of the way so you don't have to worry about them. Okay. Excuse me. Any questions, comments, concerns before we jump into the last PowerPoint of Module 5? All good? Okay. Go away, Canvas. Thank you. So today, we learned all of that wonderful stuff about the normal distribution and z-scores, the tests, z-critical values, all that good z stuff. It's great. But what do we need to know to be able to use z? Actually, it's probably in my slides coming up. I don't want to jump the gun. So now we have to acknowledge some reality now. It's time to really face reality. So first off. Why do we need distributions? Like that Z, the Z values that we got are based off of that normal curve, right? And that's a 
normal distribution. And that's super, super helpful to us because we can determine the probability of seeing a certain thing, of seeing a certain sample or maybe a certain person's height that's this tall or taller. So why does this matter? So it's not uncommon, remember, to observe one person that's super tall. That's pretty normal. Or it's not that uncommon maybe to sample one building that has really high lead content in the pipes, right? I mean, that's possible. It's not outlandish. Uh, it might not be groundbreaking or require any special attention, but if we saw an entire city or a state of very tall people, maybe not the tall people, but a very, an entire city or state with very high levels of lead content, this is much more unlikely, right? This is gonna now be cause for concern. Like we would expect maybe a few pipes from just old buildings, but for an entire city, now we have to worry that there's something going on. So how unlikely something, uh, how unlikely does something have to be for us to conclude that there's something going on though? Like if you saw one water sample that had this high a lid, it's like, is something going on with the whole city? Mm, probably not. What about 10 that had this high a lid? Maybe. What about 10 that had this high of lead? Like, oh, okay, maybe more so. Or what about 100 that had this high of lead? Like, so we're going to try to figure out what is extreme enough. Griffin. The dog just loves to lick. It's disgusting. Just hear that. Ugh. Okay, so how unlikely is unlikely enough? We've already kind of seen that we have this 95% confidence. So a very common convention in statistics is to test how likely something is and we test it at a certain level and we call that the significance level. So we'll say something like 0.05, which it's a proportion. So what is that in percent? Five percent. So that sounds like the exact complement to what we've been looking at. We look at 95 percent confidence interval, but there's also this like five percent on the outside. So that's what we're talking about with the statistical significance and we're going to dive deeply into this when we get back from spring break, but this is just like a little, little primer. So again, with z-scores, it's uh, the same value every time. If you want a 95% confidence interval, it's going to be 1.65. 95, 1.96, which is the one that you should probably kind of ingrain in your mind. It's an important one. And 99% confidence interval is 2.58. So again, notice that like 90%, the other part that we're not accounting for, it's 10%, the p-value would be, or the cutoff value, it's not actually the p-value, sorry, it's the alpha level. It's 0.1 for 95, it's 0.05, for 99, it's 0.01. So it's always what's left over, basically. But now, we need to be more realistic. Do, are we gonna know this? What does this mean again? What is this symbol sigma? What is it representing? A standard deviation for what? Or for whom? Standard deviation for a population, exactly. So what does that imply though? If you have the standard deviation for a population, what does that mean as far as you're, you asking everybody a question? That was oddly worded. Basically, you have to sample everybody, right, to get population data. So how likely is it that you're gonna have sigma? Probably not very likely. So we have to, we're not gonna throw all of the Z stuff away, like all the wonderful things you did in using a Z, like calculating a Z value for a person or for a mean going to do the exact same thing, but now we're going to be using a slightly different distribution. The T distribution. Yay! I'm sorry. So, this is always like the one little snippets that I wish y'all would watch the video instead because I pretend to be drunk while I was like filming this. It was much more fun, but it feels weird to do it now. So, here's our historical moment. We have this dude named William Seely Gossett, and he's looking pretty dapper. I put in the beer there a.k.a. student. He was a statistician, chemist, and the head brewer for Guinness. Cool. How does that relate to statistics? That's for later, dear. <laughs> After this class, my spring break starts. <laughs> but not all of you all. You're probably underage. Don't. <laughs> so, how is he related to this, and why is he called student? 
So this dude had to check the amount of sugar content in the malt that they used to make beer, right? To like ferment it and everything. And it had to be within a certain range because sugar, the amount of sugar in something and how it ferments is related to how much alcohol is going to be in it. And you don't want the batches to be varying wildly. Like most beer is about 5% uh, alcohol. You don't want it to be 10, 20, or 2. People are going to be pissed off. Well, at least if it's 2%, maybe if it's 20%, they're happy. But also, another reason it's important is because uh, that is related to how much they tax it. So they want it to stay, you know, fairly consistent, right? We don't want it to have a whole bunch of variability. We want to be able to test things. But he was frequently using very small samples. Like, yeah, there's a big batch of beer, but like how many batches are there? Not that many. So your sample size is actually kind of small. So he had, there was more uncertainty associated with all this. So he didn't, and he also didn't know, true sigma, the true average amount of difference between all of the different batches. So he created a new distribution that is very, very similar to our normal Z distribution. It's not called a Z distribution, but you know, that's kind of what we can call it. The normal distribution is very, very similar, but it's slightly different. And this particular distribution became known as student's T or the T distribution. You're like, why is it called student's T? Because Guinness would not allow him to mention beer, Guinness, or his own last name when he was publishing and doing research. Kind of like a, what are those called? NDAs, non-disclosure agreements maybe, so they didn't want him to be blabbering everything. So he just called himself student, and the T comes from people using student's test. So student's T test. Fun historical fact. Okay, so what is different about the T distribution? Sorry. What is different about the T distribution? It's going to be a little bit flatter and fatter. And what does that mean? Like, what does that mean with, we know about spreads and variation and things like that. What does it mean when something is a little bit flatter and fatter? Good, yes, exactly. There's more variation, right? Like, we're, we don't know the exact sigma. So we don't know, like, the exact truth, kind of. So we can't be, like, super duper confident. So we have to... The same way that when we take a sample, we divide by the n minus one thing, because we're always trying to be extra conservative. Like if you were to say, everybody's only different by one point, but in reality it's 10, you know, like you should always be shooting over by saying like, oh, we think it's 10 or 15 rather than minimizing. So to be more conservative in this case means to assume greater variance than there might be in the, the real population, because that is just safer and just a little bit, you don't want to be saying there's stuff there when there's not. So you're always going to be kind of conservative. And that'll hopefully make more sense as we get into uh, the hypothesis testing. And it does kind of look like a platypus because this is called platycuric because platypus means broad and wide. I love ent entomology, etiology. Dang it, every single time. One is about bugs which I, or insects, which I also like. Not all bugs are insects, but, or excuse me, not all insects are bugs. There we go. Etymology, etymology. God, I will never just ingrain that. Why do they sound the same? Bugs, insects, and words. Anyway, so yes, this is going to be flatter and wider. So we're not gonna have as much like tightness here right in the middle, so it's gonna be squished. And the difference is here in this really, really f humpy one. This one has a smaller sample size. Uh, less than 30. Remember like 30 or above is supposed to be the cutoff, but eh, it's not solid. Somebody in the chat was like, my other teacher told me that 30 is definitely not enough. It depends on the situation. This is just some kind of cutoff that everybody kind of agrees on, but excuse me, it always depends on the situation. Like again, certain, oh, is that you? <laughs> Sorry. Some people, uh, like it depends on the study you're doing. Like when we're doing like fMRI, we, <laughs> as if we're doing them, doing fMRI studies, EEG studies, things with neuroscience or maybe like uh, certain clinical trials that are very expensive and you can only get so many people. I mean, maybe just 10 people might have to be enough. There's not anything else, but uh, for like surveys, you would hope you have a lot. Like I have 2000 survey responses. You know, it just depends on what you're doing. Shoot. And then of course this one is uh, getting 30 or more. It gets closer and closer to the Z distribution. And if you were to have an infinite number of people or an infinite number of samples, 
like it basically is exactly the normal distribution too. Okay, so some of the slight differences between them, or uh, slight differences with the same purpose. So we have this, this curve and this new flatter curve. What is the point of them? We can use it to standardize samples so for comparison. We can determine the probability of observing certain means like seeing a mean this high, a mean level of lead this high. What's the probability of seeing that, assuming that there is nothing wrong with the water? And we can create confidence intervals. So that's what these kind of distributions help us do. And this is true for a lot of other types of distributions. We're just talking about the T distribution and the Z distribution. But now the T distribution handles uncertainty. So that means that we do not know this sigma value. We don't know the true average amount of difference, which makes sense, right? I mean, if you're doing a whole new study, how are you gonna know sigma? But like I've been saying, like we, we do, we start statistics usually with these very kind of easy situations where we know everything, because it's easier to start from that premise than to throw you into immediately this. Um, and we also take into account sample size when we're do using a T distribution, because with uh, our Z distribution, we kind of take into account sample size, but for a different reason, anyway. Um, and it's very similar to the Z distribution, like I just said, when the sample size is big enough, they're basically the exact same curve once your sample size gets big enough, even if you don't know sigma. Because the idea, if you think about it, population data means that you sampled everybody. So if you hypothetically went to infinity and sampled everybody, then even if you didn't initially know sigma, you're going to basically eventually know sigma from sampling all those people. So here are the two tables. I don't know if you can even really see the, oh, I can zoom, hold on. Oh no, I'm not gonna touch that, sorry. So here is the Z distribution, right? The Z table or a unit normal table. And we would have like a Z value and then we would go and figure out how much is in either the tail or the body, right? So now we're doing something a little bit different with the T table, this, yeah, T table. Haven't actually used one of these in forever. So now we have a couple of things going on here. But the similarity is that we're always looking for some sort of value, whether it's gonna be a Z value or a T value. And then we're gonna see how much proportion is in this little chunk. Let's do an example. Well, we're not doing an example yet. I did not review my notes very much today because I had a test before this, I'm sorry. Even though I've taught this like four times. So the main purpose, Z and T distributions, again, to standardize and to determine the probability of seeing something and creating those confidence intervals. Main difference between the tables, Z tables have a list of Z values that you look up the corresponding proportion or the probability, uh, or you can go and look up the proportion and go find the Z score. But T tables, now we have degrees of freedom, which we'll talk about in a moment here, the level of significance you want. So now we're not interested in all the possible probabilities in there. We only really care now about pretty much 95% or 99% or that 0.01, 0.05 thing. And there's a one and a two tail option, which we're gonna get into all this. Okay, so here are two distributions, right? We have our Z distribution that we're familiar with and what does this 1.96 relate to? 95% confidence, right? So all of it in here, 95% would fall in here. And then over here, <coughs> excuse me, we have a T distribution, and here we have a different value here. But how much do you think is in here? In the big body? Is my phone ringing? Yes, it is. Thank you, 95%, right? There's still 95% in here, but what, again, are we noticing about these curves? That one is flatter and wider, right? So, we have a lot of good peak right around the zero here, but here it's a little bit flatter and fatter. So this is a little notational thing. I don't think I usually write it this way, but I still wanna say it to you. So we have Z sub 0 0.025, and you're like, where the hell did that come from? Because we have that 0 0.05, we have these little white spots here, or these dark green spots here. How much is in that total? 5%. So if we have to split it onto both sides, we divide by two, which gives you 2.5, but because it's a proportion, it is 0 0.25. No, it's a little bit confusing, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So 
which one, remember how a confidence interval is calculated, right? We have to, we get our mean, of course, then we have some standard error, and then we're gonna multiply our standard error by, it was this guy first, like 1.96 for a 95% confidence interval when sigma is known. But now we have to multiply it by, <coughs> sorry, a different number. And that different number we're gonna look into in a second is gonna come from that T table. Like it's gonna tell us what number we should use. So knowing what you know on how to calculate a confidence interval, which one will have the wider confidence interval, all else being equal? Like they have the same sample size, the same mean, the same standard error and everything. Which one will be bigger? The sample, excuse me, the confidence interval from the Z distribution or the confidence interval from the T distribution? <coughs> Got one vote for, two votes for T, three votes for T. Nobody else wants to vote. Four votes for T, I'll take it. Make sure y'all vote next November, <laughs> right? Yeah. So yes, this one's gonna be wider. Why? Why are you blinking? Do y'all see that blinking or is it just being projected on my screen? Okay, you see it too, I'm sorry. I'm gonna spend some of spring break resetting up my lights and figuring out this dang program. I hate when it flickers like that, as it just did. So, all else being equal, the T distribution is going to have a wider confidence interval. Why? Because we have more uncertainty here, right? We don't know the true average amount of difference and we need that average amount of difference to get our standard error and everything. So we have to always be conservative and we have to make sure that we put even more muscle mentals wiggle room around our estimate, right? Because we're not sure. So we want to be confident. So to be confident, right, we have to throw our net out further. It has to go wider out. So this one from like five to about 15, this one from four to 16. So it had like one or two more points. Um, and these numbers are made up, just so you know. Don't go trying to calculate some of this stuff. Okay, oh, yes, now this, this visualization is going to keep coming back for the next like month. Took forever to do in <laughs> PowerPoint repeatedly. So how do we know where that cutoff is? Let me actually go back here real quick. So notice how we still have like this 5% on, inside our, both of our tails combined. So it's like 2.5 and 2.5. But like notice, this has to slide a little bit differently. Like this one always stays here. 1.96 stays right there because we know sigma and we don't have to deal with it and we just know 1.96. This number here, so here it's in this situation, it's 2.447. This is gonna change based on how many degrees of freedom you have and how confident you want to be. So things are gonna start sliding like further out basically. So we're gonna have to find these kind of cutoffs. So here we're gonna be using again T. We're kind of done with Z. I'm gonna keep bringing it up just to kind of compare it to T, but for the most part, we're done with, with Z. We're moving into the T world. So again, everything in here will be 95%. And what is the average in the standardized metric? What is our average value if we're talking about the t value so the same way that we did z values and we turn everything into the z scale we're going to turn everything into the t scale now and the mean is zero exactly just like with our z we're going to put the mean as zero and we're going to have some of these critical cutoff values in t the t table okay so uh as usual too for like quiz and practice purposes. This is also not on quiz number five. This whole chunk, I need to say that, to, or it's on the quiz. I need to say that to the async people. This uh, whole PowerPoint will not be on the quiz this Sunday, but it will eventually be on a quiz, like um, probably your quiz six is gonna incorporate a lot of this information. Tea table, the tea table. It's where everybody goes and has a little tea party. Yes, I like that. <laughs> um, so. There's also a lot of videos though with worksheets. So in two weeks time, when you have to take your next quiz, uh, you can look at some of those videos and I show you ad nauseum how to like play with this, but let's go over it kind of quickly. Okay, so here, let's start right here. We have, we have a yawn, <laughs> excuse me. We have degrees of freedom. What the heck are degrees of freedom? 
I'll give you a definition in a moment. But for right now, just know in this particular case, it's just going to be n minus 1. So instead, and why is it n minus 1? Again, it's another thing about being conservative, but it's also having to do with degrees of freedom, which you don't need to know all that. What you do need to know is that if I have a sample size of 10, what are my degrees of freedom? If I have a sample size of 10, what are my degrees of freedom? Perfect, 9. So it's just going to be n minus 1 for these next few uh, lessons. It's going to change later, but for right now, it's just n minus 1. So we have degrees of freedom. So this is going to kind of take into account our sample size to some extent. All right, and then we have this thing called one or two-tailed. Now, for what we're doing right now, we're just looking at confidence intervals. And our confidence intervals, do they have one or two tails? Just think about it, feel it, think of the picture. Are there one or two tails? Two, very good. So we're just gonna stay with confidence intervals. Very briefly, I'm just gonna say that this one-tailed thing, this is related to hypothesis testing when you think it can only go one direction. We're not gonna focus on that too much right now, but if you really wanna know, it's just that instead of splitting up 5%, on both sides, we'd have 2.5 and 2.5. We just put all of that 5% on one side. And you, when you go and look up T values and stuff like that, when you're writing hypothesis test, you're gonna be able to read from the question, is this a one or a two-tailed test? And I'll explain all that when we get back from spring break. But that's what that is. So you don't have to worry about that too much right now. And then we have the level of significance we want. So how confident do you wanna be? Do you want to be 95% confident? That's related to an alpha level, this proportion of the tails to 0.05. So you'd be looking for a two-tailed thing, for nine degrees of freedom, whatever, we would be like right here. Questions on that? We're gonna go into this a lot more. This is just kind of introducing you to it. Yeah, we're gonna practice with it more in the future. Getting tangled. What is this? Oh. So only the important stuff now is kind of being included in the table. With a Z table, you can look for an exact proportion and figure out how much is above or below that number. And it's possible because sigma is known, but now that sigma is unknown, we might have a super small sample size and there's not a chart for every single combination of degrees of freedom. So instead, we're really just gonna look at what's important to us, which in this case is gonna be these typical cutoff levels that are gonna be 0.1, 0.05 or 0.01. Again, not many people use this 0.1 thing. Some people report it, but they shouldn't probably. 0.05 and 0.01 are much more common. And again, this is 95% confidence. This is 99% confidence. So again, it's just the complement. It's kind of saying the same thing, but from the other side. Um, and then with the t-table, again, instead of looking at the z-value to get the proportions, we're looking for the t-value, so the standardized value that corresponds to the proportion that we want. So it's like almost a little bit backwards. Okay, so we need to know how far out that 5% or that 2.5 on each side is and what critical T value corresponds to it. Why again can't we just use 1.96 anymore? That wonderful standard value? Why are we not allowed to use that anymore? Por que no? We don't know sigma. Exactly right. <coughs> Excuse me, we don't know that standard deviation for the population. So we have to come to this instead. And because we have to take our sample size into account. But remember how I said earlier, if you notice, so like we have degrees of freedom from about one to 120, I think that says, and it even starts skipping. Uh, but then way down here, we have a teeny weeny little infinity symbol. And if you were to look way over here, the corresponding T value is 1.96, which, oh, coincidence, is it a coincidence? That is the Z value, right, associated with 95%. And like I said, if you were to ask everybody for your sample, even though you don't know true sigma, if you ask everybody, that's basically the population. So then you will figure out sigma, and then you can actually just use that 1.96 again. And also as a side note, many times, like, um, when people are not teaching a hardcore stats class, like in the neuroscience class I was taking earlier today, they tend to just use 1.96 if you have a sample greater than, I don't know, 50 or 100 sometimes, which, like if you're being really picky, it just depends. Uh, but a lot of people, for the sake of just creating a quick confidence interval, use 1.96.
but you should tell them, hey, do you have a big enough sample size? Do you know stigma? But do it proper, do it with, do it politely. <laughs> Don't be calling out your professors all rude like. Okay, my computer just took a second there. Okay, so these degrees of freedom thing, I'm not gonna go into this in crazy detail because even I get confused by it and it's a deeper stats subject uh, topic. But let me just say this real quick. So degrees of freedom are the number of scores that are allowed to vary when you're calculating a statistic. What the heck does that mean? So let's assume that you want an average of 85. Hopefully you want a higher average. Hopefully you saw from your R assignment, most people get really good grades in this class. So you want an average of like 85 on three exams for some other class, it's not mine. So if you think about it, you have no restrictions. You can get whatever grade on the first one and the second one within reason. But the last grade that you get, like let's say that you're like, okay, I got a 75 and then I got an 85, but that very last grade that you get has to be a certain value. In this case, it has to be 95 for you to get the 85. Now, again, this goes deeper as far as why this is related to statistics, but it's really, again, about the very last number has to be it's already predetermined because you're working with the mean that you calculate. All the other numbers that you're playing with can be whatever they want, but that final number for you to get the average that was calculated has to be this certain value. So that's what it means, that you can vary all of your exams except for that very last one, because that very last one has to be that thing to get you to the mean that you calculated. Again, you do not need to know this for any sort of quiz or assignment. The only thing you need to know as far as degrees of freedom go is that you need to do n minus one for right now, but in the future, that's gonna change. All right, so quick practice. If we have a sample size of n equals 10, what are my degrees of freedom? So somebody already said that, but let's say it again. Nine, good. Now if I want to construct a two-tailed confidence, uh, a 95% confidence interval, what are the critical values? Oh, excuse me. I'm assuming nobody can see this, right? <laughs> Let me tentatively zoom in. There we go. Okay, so first off, which row are we going to be looking at? Oh, somebody's already got a guess. Good. I don't know. I have to, I have to go and do it too. So here, we're looking right here, right? Wait a minute. Oh, I've been wanting to use this in class. Uh, it would be great if I was able to keep one of these in class and just Okay, so we're looking right here. Okay, everybody see what row we're looking at? Great. Now, which column do, I like this, which column do I want? Here's where things get a little confusing. Which column do I need to look at? Do we have any interest in 0.25 or 0.5? Ooh, do we want 0.5 in two tails? That would be 25% in each tail. This is why proportions are so tricky. There you go, we want 0.05, but do we want this one? Why not? It's 0.05. Por que no? Oh, it's a one tail, that's right. <laughs> Silly goose. <laughs> yeah, so we want this one right here. So, we are gonna come down here, and this was our ninth one, I believe. I'm gonna go with what somebody said in the chat. So 2.262 is our critical T value. Okay, does everybody see how I got that? Again, there's gonna be more of this in the future, so don't feel bad if you're like, wait, do it again. There'll, there'll be more later. Oh, the irritation. There we go, perfect. Okay. Great. So now here we're going to put that we have a negative one and a positive one, right? Because we need, it's a mirror thing. It's symmetrical. So we're going to put the positive one, the negative one. Same with the, like the z-score, the z-table, how there were no negative values. There are not going to be any negative values here either. You're going to have to know based on the question or based on if you're doing a confidence interval that you need to either have a negative, a positive, or both of them. For all of our confidence intervals, we need both. 
We need one on the bottom and one on the top. Okay, so now we're going to look at these confidence intervals again, but now we're going to be more realistic and remember that we do not know sigma. So we're going to start using T instead of Z. So here is the formula. Same thing, right? We just have our mean, a T critical, and what is this whole thing called? Oh, this is so annoying. What is this whole unit called? The standard error. Exactly. Very good. So everything is the same. It's just that now, I mean, you can still calculate a standard deviation. It's just not the absolute truth from the population. So we're just going to have a standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size that you took. And we're going to use a critical t value rather than z, because we have to go and look it up based on our degrees of freedom and how confident we want to be. OK, so one more time. Our confidence intervals wider or narrower when sigma is unknown. A lot of people are already immediately saying wider. I'm going to say it again, by the way, y'all. Really appreciate it when y'all come to class, turn on your video, and interact with me. Not enough teachers thank the students for being good students. So thank you. Appreciate it. OK, yes, it is definitely wider and fatter. For a second, I was like, are you calling me fatter and thicker? Dear God. <laughs> yes, it's fatter and thicker, right? So does that mean, so let's, the confidence interval from your t distribution when sigma is unknown, does that make your confidence interval more or less precise? I just got two votes for that one. Three votes, four. Yes, it's going to be less precise, right? If things have to be wider, Remember that example that's like, I'm super confident, 100% confident that everybody in here is between 12 and 100. Like, that doesn't tell me anything about the average age of the class. Like, it's just so wide, and that's how you can be 100% confident. But if you want to be confident, 95% confident when things are unknown, you're going to have to spread your, not your guess, but like your estimate has to be even further out to make sure that you capture the truth. <laughs> I don't believe that for a second. Um, and does precision mean wider or narrower? One more time. Yeah, more precise means more narrow. Good. Okay. So what affects the width of our confidence interval again? Well, our margin of error, right? Because that's, that's the thing that you add and subtract. But what is the margin of error determined by? Or like, what affects the margin of error? Your sample size, the standard deviation, and the critical value. So basically, how confident you want to be. And we know that t is always going to result in a wider confidence interval because it like penalizes, kind of you can think, smaller sample sizes and the unknown sigma. So for a 95% confidence interval, z is always 1.96, while t depends on the sample size. But it's always going to be equal to, so if n is really big, right, t is equal to z, basically or greater than z. The t value will always be greater than z or equal to if the sample size is huge. And the larger your critical value, the wider your confidence interval, right? Because if this is a bigger number, you're going to make this whole thing, which is the margin of error, bigger, which makes it wider. Frightened me. That's going to drop. Okay, one more time. I'm just going to keep drilling this home. So the standardized T value for the 95% with 10 people, sigma unknown, was that 2.269. So our cutoffs are like, right? I just went like, <coughs> and like pushed them out a smidge. If we compare it to the Z distribution where sigma is known, right? See, that would be that 1.96. So that would be in a little bit closer, right? So with unknown stuff, we have to go and push it out just a little bit. And again, the wider your critical t value, the, the larger, I'm sorry, the wider your confidence interval will be, meaning that it'll be less precise. 
Try it. A random sample of 25 college students reveals that they worked an average, this is a terrible example from a textbook that I hate, <sighs> revealed that they work an average of six years at a job before getting promoted with a standard deviation of 1.2 years. Compute and interpret a 99% confidence interval for the mean number of years worked a job before being promoted. You can always tell when it's not my example because I do not use decimals <laughs> and I never use 99 to make life easier. It's fine. We're going to get through it together. So here is the information at hand. It takes people six years on average to get promoted. There's a standard deviation of 1.3 years. We had 25 for our sample size, but that means we have 24 degrees of freedom because n minus one. And we want a level of significance. We want to be 99% confident. So our level of significance is 0.01. Andiamo. I did not even allow you all to play with this. So in this case, we go and look for our degrees of freedom, which we had 24 way down here. And then we go all the way out here and we look for the 0.01 now, because this was the 0.05. Now we want 0.01 and here it is. And what is that number? 2.792, seven, <laughs> 2.797, yes. Now. Why is this bigger than the last, remember the other one was 2.6 something? And we had only 10 people in that sample. Why is this one bigger? Wouldn't you expect it to be smaller with the larger sample size? Why is this one bigger? So it, we're almost there. Say it again, the confidence interval that we're calculating, but what about the confidence interval we're calculating? Why is it, why is it pushing it out wider? There you go. We're doing 99% confidence, right? We want to be even more confident. And what do we have to do to be more confident? We're going to be less precise, but we can be more confident. We push our thing out to be wider. So that is why in this case, the T value is actually greater than the last one. I always do this, <laughs> always jump the gun. So again, why is the critical T so large? Because we want to be 99% confident this time. So we have to widen our confidence interval to try to capture the truth, true mu. Okay, so you would go through this whole calculation. So six was the mean number of years until promotion. Our critical T value associated with 99% confidence. We have our standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Now this is just sample size, not n minus one. I know this crap gets confusing. I am sorry, just keep your equations near and dear to you. This is just by square root of n, this whole thing, standard error. This whole thing, margin of error. So we add and subtract that to six and we end up with 5.27 and 6.73. What does that mean? What does this confidence interval tell us? Like interpret it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do we interpret these? What are these values? What is the scale? What do these values even represent? What were we talking about? Does anybody remember the question? Oh, an employee is likely to get a promotion within 5.27 years to 6.73 years. I like that. That works for me. Now, people are going to, here I will actively cuss. People are gonna bitch about the way that you interpret a confidence interval because some people will say there's like a, there's a 99% chance that the truth is in here, that the true average is in there. It's not completely accurate to say that. Most people aren't gonna notice the nuance difference when you say it that way, but it's like, it's either in there or it's not. You know, it's not a probability kind of thing. It just is or it isn't in there. What we are saying with this, I think it's in the next line. I say it over and over again, a whole bunch of different ways. So if you were to repeat this, that you take a sample of 25 people and you ask them how many years did it take before they get promoted, 99 out of those 100 times that you go and take a sample of 25 people, the truth will be in there. But that also means that you could be that one in 99 that is wrong. That's what it's basically saying. They made me say it in high school. Do we have to say it now? 
I don't, I don't think I make you in any of your questions like, well, maybe in the R1. But what I'm more interested in is like, explain it to a layman, because this is statistical literacy. If any of you are gonna go be statisticians, you will learn all of the nitty gritty of all this. But I want you all to be able to share your knowledge and your literacy with normal people and what a confidence interval means. Like I'm sure normal people would see, a, like the polls for uh, the election, right? You see like these numbers that project one person to win, but nobody's looking at that margin of error. You now understand what that means. I want you to tell people like that means that their true number, their true percentage could be 45 to 55. So we don't actually know who's gonna win. And you can be wise like that. But if we're getting really technical, again, <clears throat> there is, if you were to go and do this again, and ask another 25 people and ask another 25 people and keep on doing that 100 times, 99 out of those 100 times you'll capture the truth and one out of those times you'll be wrong and you might be that one that's wrong. And this is what we're acknowledging with these levels of significance and confidence and soon enough p-values. Okay, so I am going to repeatedly be showing the same visualization and I this is not a standard thing that most people do I think when they teach stats but this is how I think of it and this is how I like to look at it so we have our two scales right what was the standard scale we used to always use before it was our main standard scale that we fell in love with our Z scale right we're not going to use that anymore for the most part I mean you're still going to use it for your quiz I think but after that <laughs> we're going to be using the T scale but it's the same thing, right? We're going to translate these raw values into standardized values. And we're always basically going to take, in this case, the mean was six that we calculated. We're going to do some magic and we are going to transform it to where the mean will now be zero and the critical value that you go and calculate, it's like corresponding value in the original raw scale is the confidence interval number. So this relates to this. We're basically translating this number into the, or vice versa. We're just using this to, com they're, they're the complement each other. They say the same thing in a different language. One is French, one's Italian, but they're still saying, they still have the same exact message. And I don't know, it's up to you to kind of feel like, I think most people want to think of things in the original scale because that makes more sense. This is the scale of years before promotion. But hopefully you'll start to see, and my whole point before with standardization is that if you forget like, oh, what were we doing? Some sort of the number of years to get promoted. And then later it's, oh, the number of people or the number of hours people sleep. Like you might forget what the scale is, but if you come back to your original, the st excuse me, the standardized scale, you'll always kind of have a vibe. Like you'll always kind of know like, oh, you know, if it's negative 4.2, that's way out here. That's a really, really far off value from what we would expect. So just kind of marinate with these, this idea of standardized scale, original scale, and we just translate back and forth between the two. So what we were saying again with that 99% confidence, I know there's a lot going on with this, and sometimes I have teachers too who give me things and I'm like, oh my God, there's so much going on here. Look at it later by yourself and just have a little moment because I'm going through it kind of fast. But so remember I said that 99 out of 100 times we will get the same average that uh, what is it, six, six years before uh, being promoted. And it'll be somewhere between that 99 of 100 times we're going to get a mean that's between 5.27 and 6.73. Every now and then you're going to get one that is too extreme, basically. Something like these are also made up. So let's say that there was an underestimate. Maybe you sampled and interviewed a lot of people who um, they were at some job that they just got promoted right away. And so in this case, maybe the average number of years to get promoted was 4.3. The corresponding T value is negative 6.54, way out here, really unexpected. It's not, it's not what we would have expected in here. And then an, conversely, another an overestimate example could be maybe it was 7.2 years and the corresponding t-value would be 4.61. Again, far out from what we would expect. Now, did you just make a mistake? Were you just wrong? Or maybe there's something different about that group. Maybe these people, the particular job that they're in, maybe it's different than other people, or maybe they are overachievers, something. And this is gonna be the essence in the future. We're not quite there yet, but when we start doing t-tests, 
that's what we're trying to figure out. Like, is this just an extreme case under the null? It's just an extreme kind of whoopsies, you just kind of messed up. Or is this true? Is this like a different group of people that these groups of people get promoted more quickly or these groups of people get promoted more slowly? But that's coming up later. So which one? If I ask you to calculate a confidence interval, how are you going to know which method or which table to use? You can probably look at the quiz. That'll probably tell you which one to use. But uh, you can always know, too, if sigma is known. If you see Greek, you use Z. If it's an unknown sigma, or you see an S, uh, then it's unknown variance, and you would use the T distribution. Why are we doing this again? Always checking back in as to why the heck are we doing this? So, so far we've been calculating confidence intervals for statistics of interest, like the mean, which is great. And we're getting like a confidence interval around that mean, cool. And because point estimates aren't actually that precise, so we want to be more confident, we put a little bit of that above and below, a little bit of that more or less, so we can be more confident in our estimates. And we have to acknowledge our shortcomings in regards to the sample. So we use degrees of freedom and, yeah, no sigma. I know it's getting boring, but we're working our way up to what we really do with statistics. We need all that information that you've, we've just covered over the last few weeks so we can get to the real thing, which is actually hypothesis testing. This is what most statistics is. I mean, people use descriptive statistics, but what we are trying to do usually is do hypothesis testing and make inferences. Oh, and then this is how you can do it in R, but there are videos to show you how to do that. <gasps> it's 421. <laughs> uh, uh, do I have anything I should do right now? What do y'all think we should do right now? Peace out and let you do all your other work for your other classes. Do your R assignment. Grade. Create a secret handshake. Supposedly Freemasons like do this thing with the pinky. Have you heard of that? I can't do it with my own hand. Oh, I kind of can. They go like this and from the outside it looks totally normal. But like you basically are like putting these two things together. But from the outside, if you were to shake someone's hand, it doesn't look like you're doing anything. <laughs> Later. I don't allow beverages until 7 p.m. I might start at 6.30. I'm gonna dye a wig. That's what I'm gonna do right now. <laughs> Actually, I'm probably gonna have to do some office hours for somebody, which I do not mind, it is my job, but I am canceling them, or I'm stopping them at 5.30 because either nobody's gonna come, or yeah, I want to start my spring break. I am going somewhere, so I have to do stuff. What color? I don't know. I'm gonna try to dye a dark color wig to see if it works. I have discovered a secret. I need to make a YouTube video about it. You can dye wigs with acrylic paint. Yeah, I know, I need some purple wigs in my life. I have a bunch of like crappy old wigs that I'm just gonna experiment on. But I also did a mint green one that looks like Lady Gaga circa 2010. I just need to fix it a little bit and that'll be coming after. All right, a wig show. Yeah, I have about 20 or 30 now. I'm so sad that we're going back to school because I totally am not gonna wear this to school. It's too uncomfortable to wear all day. <laughs> we'll see. I don't have nearly as much, I don't have nearly as many classes as I used to, so maybe I won't be on campus as much. Is everyone excited for the course schedule to come out? I'm thrilled. I'm all about electives now. I don't have to take many required courses, so now I have to go and look for undergrad classes. Maybe I'll see you in some of my classes. April 6th! Is it really that far? Jeez. When are they going to email me to ask when I want to teach? Sometimes they give me leeway and I can say what time, but I used to teach at 9.30 in the morning and 3.30 in the afternoon. So I was either in class or teaching class from 9.30 to 5 every Tuesday, Thursday. Rage, I really don't want to do that again. I hope they let me teach one class async. <laughs> Get that money. All right, I'm just rambling now. So if you want to stay and hang and have some fun with whatever I'm doing here, you're welcome to. Otherwise, have an awesome spring break. Please be safe if you're doing any traveling or anything like that. Don't be stupid. Like, you know, just be good. Be safe, stay hydrated, drink plenty of water. And make sure you get your assignments in on Sunday. Please don't forget that. Get that out of the way now so you don't have to worry about it, you know, later. 
Otherwise, yeah. Have a great spring break, everybody. I'll see you all when we come back. Peace.